Welcome everyone to this, the 10th session of our book club, Reasoned Argument, the Counter to Cancel Culture. Tonight, there are a number of moving parts. Last session and this session really intertwine and overlap with one another. So it doesn't hurt to place yourself where we were and where we're going this time. Although I mentioned all three of the great orators, we really focused only on Clay, the, the great compromiser, really a mediator often a mediator between Webster and Calhoun. So he's an interesting character because he's so talented, we heard from Lincoln. But also, besides doing what he's doing primarily in the congressional branch, but also in the executive branch at times, Secretary of State at one point, running for president three times and being involved in other presidencies. In any event, he's also representing clients, including Aaron Burr at one time. And he has a number of Supreme Court arguments. So he's talented as an orator in many contexts. And with that background, and his often being in sync with, Cal uh, with uh, Webster, but in this case, closer to Calhoun, he is the ultimate deal maker. But he's not only a deal maker, he is a persuader. And that is essential to what he does. So let's start tonight and look at our three think points. So first, Webster's reply to Calhoun's three resolutions. Secondly, Calhoun's reply to Webster. And finally, comparing the deliberative and forensic rhetoric by looking at Webster's trial closing in a murder case. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna look at is Webster's reply to Calhoun's three resolutions. Webster was a Federalist until 1825. And during the War of 1812, he was a nullifier along with the Federalists in New England. But then he became a National Republican as did Clay. And he was there with that party until 1833 when basically it goes out and he along with Clay starts the Whig Party in 1833, and he's in that party until he dies in 1852. He was twice Secretary of State, twice he ran for president, and he had 200 Supreme Court arguments and famous ones. He was on the winning side, indeed the, the main advocate in the Dartmouth College case, and he was one of the three advocates winning in the McCulloch case, the bank case. And by the way, that case was argued back and forth for nine days. Can you imagine that? And finally, in the Gibbons case, he rep represented and won for Gibbons. So with that background, let's talk about the political background some more regarding the tariff of 1833. A lot of this really resolves around Jackson. And you've heard, or if you've read, in Professor Barnett's book, he talks and discusses between 80, pages 87 to 89, how Jackson and his successor Van Buren really moved in a democratic way away from the Republican way, that is the democratic Republican way. And people like Clay, some of them, left the new Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party from Jackson on is quite a bit different from what it was under the Democratic Republican Party. There's this emphasis as, Pre as Professor Barnett talks about, about the, the democracy, which is not something Jefferson really would have talked about in those terms. In any event, the politics of it is such that the others, as I may have mentioned, are anti-Jackson, but they're not only anti-Jackson accusing him of being a king and moving towards a one-man rule, but they emphasize in a way understandably and think Congress should be the ultimate power. Now that is more consistent with Jeffersonianism. The terror fight, although it involves slavery in the background, it is primarily about the the challenge of nullification and possible secession. That's why it's so critical. But slavery runs throughout here. And 
what was considered to be the most famous speech ever given in the US Senate was given by Webster in 1830 on the issue of slavery. And he's responding, it's his second response to Senator Hayne of South Carolina. But it was Hayne instead of Calhoun because at that point Calhoun was vice president. But really it's also aimed at Calhoun. But in 1833, you have the culmination of a building dispute beginning with the 1828 tariff, which was a protectionist tariff benefiting the Northeast. But then the tariff goes higher in 1830. And that's after the election of Jackson and the South expected better from Jackson. And that creates uh, the movement towards nullification. There's first of all, an exposition and a protest from South Carolina written anonymously by Calhoun. But then Calhoun has a break with Jackson, whom he was instrumental in getting to be president. Interestingly, Calhoun was vice president, not only for Jackson, but for the person he beat, John Quincy Adams. But he leaves, in, in both cases, he's left his president high and dry. And in this case, he leaves to counter Jackson. It's really interesting in that, even though Calhoun and Webster are at odds, they're at odds with Jackson. In all of this, Clay is trying to balance as he does and come through it without having a secession. In any event, when he comes back to the Senate, what Calhoun does is to put down a marker, as it were, about three resolutions. And the most important is the first. And it's all about his understanding of the Constitution as being a compact, he says, between the states or among the states. But in any event, this is the, the real principal division between Webster and Calhoun over the nature of the union. That's what's really important here. Into this mix, we have President Jackson, although he's a slave owner and generally favors states' rights, he, like Jefferson, is president. And in the position of president, you're going to end up doing things that you might not have done if you were in the Congress or you weren't in the government at all. In any event, he's infuriated by the notion that South Carolina is going to secede or at least attempt to nullify federal law. And so he submits to Congress a bill called the Force Bill, seeking authorization to send federal agents, troops into South Carolina to collect the tariffs. If South Carolina won't do that, it is in this context then that we have the following. Here is Webster's rebuttal to Calhoun but also his positive statement about the nature of the union. Mr. President, the gentleman from South Carolina has admonished us to be mindful of the opinions of those who shall come after us. We must take our chance, sir, as to the light in which posterity will regard us. I do not decline its judgment, nor withhold myself from its scrutiny, feeling that I am performing my public duty with singleness of heart and to the best of my ability, I fearlessly trust myself to the country, now and hereafter, and leave both my motives and my character to its decision. The Honorable Gentleman has declared that on the decision of the question now in debate may depend the cause of liberty itself. I am of the same opinion, but then, sir, the liberty on which I think is staked on the contest is not political liberty in any general and undefined character, but our own well-understood and long-enjoyed American liberty. The gentleman's resolutions affirm, in effect, that these 24 United States are held together only by a subsisting treaty, resting for its fulfillment and continuance on no inherent power of its own, but on the plighted faith of each state, or in other words, that our union is but a league, and, as a consequence from this proposition, they further affirm that, as sovereigns are subject to no superior power, the states must judge each for itself of any alleged violation of the League. 
and if such violation be supposed to have occurred, each may adopt any mode or measure of redress which it shall think proper. You may recall that Richard Weaver was criticizing the three great orators for arguing primarily from circumstance. That's certainly not the case in this argument. On either side, both Webster and Calhoun are arguing about the nature of the union. This is necessarily definitional. It's very important. And because of that great disagreement, it is most difficult to get together and make compromises based on circumstance. Other consequences naturally follow too from the main proposition. If a league between sovereign powers has no limitations as to the time of its duration and contain nothing making it perpetual, it subsists only during the good pleasure of the parties, although no violation be complained of it. If in the opinion of either party it be violated, such party may say that he will no longer fulfill its obligations on his part, but will consider the whole league or compact at an end, although it might be one of its stipulations that it should be perpetual. Upon this principle, the Congress of the United States in 1798 declared null and void the Treaty of Alliance between the United States and France, though it professed to be a perpetual alliance. If the violation of the League be accompanied with serious injuries, the suffering party, being sole judge of his own mode and measure of redress, has a right to indemnify himself by reprisals on the offending members of the League and reprisals, if the circumstances of the case require it, may be followed by direct avowed and public war. The necessary import of the resolution, therefore, is that the United States are connected only by a league, that it is in the good pleasure of every state to decide how long she will choose to remain a member of this league, that any state may determine the extent of her own obligations under it, and accept or reject which shall be decided by the whole, that she may also determine whether her rights have been violated, what is the extent of the injury done her, and what mode and measure of redress her wrongs may make it fit and expedient for her to adopt. The result of the whole is that any state may secede at pleasure, that any state may resist a law which she herself may choose to say exceeds the power of Congress, and that as a sovereign power she may redress her own grievances by her own arm, at her own discretion. She may make reprisals. She may cruise against the property of other members of the League. She may authorize captures and make open war. The argument from consequence is a different type of argument. And if that's the only kind of argument one makes, then it says something about the nature of the person as Webster, as, I'm sorry, Weaver has said. But that's not the case here. The consequences are aimed at people who don't agree with him regarding the nature of the union, but may be appalled and should be appalled by the consequences that will necessarily follow. If, sir, this be our political condition, it is time the people of the United States understood it. Let us look for a moment to the practical consequences of these opinions. One state, holding an embargo law unconstitutional, may declare her opinion and withdraw from the union. She secedes. Another, forming and expressing the same judgment on a law laying duties on imports, may withdraw also. She secedes. And as, in her opinion, money has been taken out the pockets of her citizens illegally under pretense of this law, and as she has power to redress their wrongs, she may demand satisfaction. And if refused, she may take it with a strong hand. The gentleman has himself pronounced the collection of duties under existing laws to be nothing but robbery. Robbers, of course, may be rightfully dispossessed of the fruits of their flagitious crimes, and therefore reprisals, impositions on the commerce of other states, foreign alliances against them, or open war, are all modes of redress justly open to the discretion and choice of South Carolina. For she is to judge of her own rights, and to seek satisfaction for her own wrongs, in her own way. Mr. President, every man must see that these are all questions which can arise only after a revolution. They presuppose the breaking up of the government. While the Constitution lasts, they are repressed. They spring up to annoy and startle us only from its grave. The Constitution does not provide for events which must be preceded by its own destruction. 
Secession, therefore, since it must bring these consequences with it, is revolutionary, and nullification is equally revolutionary. What is revolution? Why, sir, that is revolution which overturns or controls or successfully resists the existing public authority, that which arrests the exercise of the supreme power, that which introduces a new paramount authority into the rule of the state. Now, sir, this is the precise object of nullification. It attempts to supersede the supreme legislative authority. It arrests the arm of the executive magistrate. It interrupts the exercise of the accustomed judicial power. Under the name of an ordinance, it declares null and void within the state all the revenue laws of the United States. Is not this revolutionary? Sir, so soon as this ordinance shall be carried into effect, a revolution will have commenced in South Carolina. She will have thrown off the authority to which her citizens have heretofore been subject. She will have declared her own opinions and her own will to be above the laws and above the power of those who are entrusted with their administration. If she makes good these declarations, she is revolutionized. As to her, it is as distinctly a change of the supreme power as the American Revolution of 1776. This point about secession of one state leading to secession of all states has been proven out by history. When the Berlin Wall fell and Eastern Europe started breaking apart from the Soviet Union, it was one after another. Once one breaks, they all break. That's the point. That's basic human experience. It is predictable. But no, he then says, this is a revolution. Why is that important? Because the South, when it did finally secede, tried to make the argument that it was doing so based on the Constitution rather than a revolution. There are two different arguments if you're arguing under the Constitution and its nature, as opposed to, as we did in the Declaration of Independence, clearly state, we are breaking. And here are the arguments that justify the break. But, sir, while practical nullifications in South Carolina would be, as to herself, actual and distinct revolution, its necessary tendency must also be to spread revolution and to break up the Constitution, as to all the other states. It strikes a deadly blow at the vital principles of the whole Union. To allow state resistance to the laws of the Congress to be rightful and proper, to admit nullification in some states and yet not to expect to see a dismemberment of the entire government, appears to me the wildest illusion, and the most extravagant folly. The gentleman seems not conscious of the direction, or the rapidity of his own course. The current of his opinions sweeps him along. He knows not whither. To begin with nullification, with the avowed intent nevertheless not to proceed to secession, dismemberment, and general revolution, is if one were to take the plunge of Niagara and cry out that he would stop halfway down. In the one case, as in the other, the rash adventurer must go to the bottom of the dark abyss below, were it not that that abyss has no discovered bottom. And now, sir, against all these theories and opinions, I maintain, one, that the Constitution of the United States is not a league, confederacy, or compact between the people of the several states in their sovereign capacities, but a government proper, founded on the adoption of the people and creating direct relations between itself and the individuals. Two, that no state authority has power to dissolve these relations, that nothing can dissolve them but revolution, and that consequently there can be no such thing as secession without revolution. Three, that there is a supreme law consisting of the Constitution of the United States, and acts of Congress passed in pursuance of it, and treaties, and that, in cases not capable of assuming the character of a suit of law or equity, Congress must judge of and finally interpret this supreme law so often as it has occasion to pass acts of legislation, and in cases capable of assuming, and actually assuming, the character of a suit, the Supreme Court of the United States is the final interpreter. Four that an attempt by a state to abrogate, annul, or nullify an act of Congress or to arrest its operation within her limits on the ground that, in her opinion, such law is unconstitutional is a direct usurpation on the just powers of the general government and on the equal rights of other states, a plain violation of the Constitution, and a proceeding essentially revolutionary in its character and tendencies.
these arguments are easy for Webster to make, even though earlier he had been a nullifier. That is to say, these are the essential arguments that undergird the McCullough case and the Gibbons case. And that's the whole point. What is the nature of the union? Mr. President, if the friends of nullification should be able to propagate their opinions and give them practical effort, they would, in my judgment, prove themselves the most skillful architects of ruin, the most effectual extinguisher of high-raised expectation, the greatest blasters of human hopes that any age has produced. They would stand up to proclaim, in tones which would pierce the ears of half the human race, that the last great experiment of representative government had failed. They would send forth sounds at the hearing of which the doctrine of the divine right of kings would feel, even in its grave, a returning sensation of vitality and resuscitation. Millions of eyes of those who now feed their inherent love of liberty on the success of the American example would turn away from beholding our dismemberment and find no place on earth whereon to rest their gratified sight. Amidst the incantations and orgies of nullification, secession, disunion, and revolution would be celebrated the funeral rites of constitutional and republican liberty. But, sir, if the government do its duty, if it act with firmness and with moderation, these opinions cannot prevail. Be assured, sir, be assured, that among the political sentiments of this people, the love of union is still uppermost. They will stand fast by the Constitution and by those who defend it. I rely on no temporary expedience, on no political combination, but I rely on the true American feeling, the genuine patriotism of the people, and the imperative decision of the public voice. This last passage should really speak to many of us in this day and age, because just as then they could see that there was the great possibility that the United States would go into civil war and that the great experiment in liberty would end, much to the disappointment of many people around the world. The difference may be today that while we could be at a similar situation, but different in many of the circumstances, that there are those around the world who would love to see this great experiment in liberty end. And finally, New Rule Americans must answer the question posed on Twitter last week by Representative Marjorie Taylor, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Should America have a national divorce? Her question does represent the thinking of a lot of Americans on both sides. Ben Shapiro floated the idea that our best hope now is a friendly separation of states. 66% of Republicans in the South say they would support secession to join a new confederacy. 41% of Biden voters want to secede. Let's now go to the second part, and that's about Calhoun's reply to Webster. Little background on Calhoun. He started out as a Democratic Republican to 1828. That's when Jackson wins, and he's instrumental. He's a Democrat from 1828 to uh, during that year, and then an independent from 28 to 39, and then he comes back as a Democrat from 1839 to 50. But during that period of independence, he's sympathetic to the Whigs, and I guess that's why we would classify him as a Whig, which he's not really. But in any event, he's movable in many ways. Early in his career, he was a definite nationalist and he was making a great name for himself and he was Secretary of War early on. And then he represents South Carolina variously in the Senate while he is alternately in as Vice President as I indicated under two presidents. He runs for the presidency three times himself, doesn't make it obviously. So he leaves the vice presidency under Jackson in order to write these resolutions and go public with them in the Senate. As he'll say, the most important one is the first one. So I'll read that one. Resolve that the people of the several states composing these United States are united as parties to a constitutional compact to which the people of each state acceded as a separate and sovereign community, each binding itself by its own particular ratification, and that the union of which the said 
compact is the bond is a union between the states ratifying the same that is the compact theory that gets equated with states rights and it's important that conservatives today many of whom still refer to the term states rights that they be careful in terms of their meaning because this is really what states rights meant and certainly it was the term that was used by southern segregationists with a similar meaning so the proper word for conservatism is federalism but that requires that you understand the federalist papers and how the union is knitted together both vertically and horizontally through a system of separated and checking power so let's go and listen to calhoun and his argument having made these remarks which have been forced upon me i shall now proceed directly to the subject before the senate and in order that it may with all its bearings be fully understood i must go back to the period at which i introduced the resolutions they were introduced in connection with the bill which has passed this house and is now pending before the other that bill was couched in general terms without naming south carolina or any other state though it was understood and avowed by the committee as intended to act directly on her believing that the government had no right to use force in the controversy and that the attempt to introduce it rested upon principles utterly subversive of the constitution and the sovereignty of the states I drew up the resolutions and introduced them expressly with the view to test those principles, with a desire that they should be discussed and voted on before the bill came up for consideration. The majority ordered otherwise. The resolutions were laid on the table and the bill taken up for discussion. Under this arrangement, which it was understood originated with the committee that reported the bill, I, of course, concluded that its members would proceed in the discussion and explain the principles and the necessity for the bill before the other senators would enter in the discussion, and particularly those from South Carolina. Understanding, however, that by the arrangement of the committee, it was allotted to the senator from Tennessee to close the discussion on the bill. I waited to the last moment in expectation of hearing from the senator from Massachusetts. He is a member of the committee. But not hearing from him, I rose to speak to the bill. And as soon as I had concluded, the senator from Massachusetts arose, I will not say to reply to me, and certainly not to discuss the bill, but the resolutions which had been laid on the table, as I have stated. I do not state these facts in the way of complaint, but in order to explain my own course. The senator having direct his argument against my resolutions, I felt compelled to seize the first opportunity to call them up from the table and to assign a day for their discussion, in the hope not only that the Senate would hear me in their vindication, but also would afford me an opportunity of taking the sense of this body on the great principles on which they are based. The senator from Massachusetts, in his argument against the resolutions, directed his attack almost exclusively against the first, on the ground, I suppose, that it was the basis of the other two, and that unless the first could be demolished, the others would follow, of course. In this he was right. As plain and as simple as the facts contained in the first are, they cannot be admitted to be true without admitting the doctrines for which I and the state represent, contend. He commenced his attack with a verbal criticism on the resolution in the course of which he objected strongly to two words, constitutional and accede. To the former on the ground that the word, as used, was obscure, that it conveyed no definite meaning. Calhoun, like Webster, is making a definitional argument. But what he's going to do in the next section is to really, at least rhetorically, nail Webster on the definitional issue of constitutional compact. That is to say, he brings up a whole series of references to constitutional compact 
that Webster himself had made in his famous speech against Hain. So the term constitutional compact can be ambiguous, but since Calhoun, it has made, been made to stand very clearly for the compact or a compact among the states. Having now noticed the criticism of the senator, I shall proceed to meet and repel the main assault on the resolution. He directed his attack against the strong point, the very horn of the citadel of state rights. The senator clearly perceived that if the Constitution be a compact, it was impossible to deny the assertions contained in the resolutions or to resist the consequences which I had drawn from them, and accordingly directed his whole fire against that point. But after so vast an expenditure of ammunition, not the slightest impression, so far as I can perceive, has been made. But to drop the simile, after a careful examination of the notes which I took of what the senator said, I am now at a loss to know whether, in the opinion of the senator, our Constitution is a compact or not, though the almost entire argument of the senator was directed to that point. At one time he would seem to deny directly and positively that it was a compact, while at another he would appear, in language not less strong, to admit that it was. I have collated all that the senator has said on this point. I've edited out the particular references that he makes to Webster's speech is not important for us today as such. But what he goes on to say here is really quite stunning. Listen. I have shown that the Constitution affords not the least evidence of the mighty change of the political condition of the states and the country which the senator supposed it affected. And I intend now, by the most decisive proof, drawn from the constitutional instrument itself to show that no such change was intended and that the people of the states are united under it as states and not as individuals. On this point, there is a very important part of the Constitution entirely and strangely overlooked by the Senator in this debate, as it is expressed in the first resolution, which furnishes the conclusive evidence not only that the Constitution is a compact, but a subsisting compact binding between the states. I allude to the seventh article, which provides that the ratification of the Convention of Nine States shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states so ratifying the same. Yes, between the states. These little words mean a volume. Compact, not laws, bind between the states. And it here binds, not between individuals, but between the states. The states ratifying, implying, as strong as language can make it, that the Constitution is what I have asserted it to be, a compact ratified by the states and a subsisting compact binding the states ratifying it. I said it was stunning, and the reason is, if you are aware at all of what Patrick Henry said, which you are, having listened to it, the whole point was, it wasn't we the states, it was we the people of the United States. I mean, that was so well understood at the time of ratification, unless one totally ignores that, it's difficult to imagine what he could possibly base this on. Well, he is going to give a reason. <laughs> and the reason is what? The, the ratification process. But this totally ignores the fact that, as Madison said in Federalist 39, we have a compound republic, and certain parts of it are national and certain parts of it are federal. The fact that one part is federal and more than one part doesn't make it all a compact. What's interesting is that near the end of his life, Calhoun writes political theory. And next to the Federalist, what he wrote in terms of political theory is really quite outstanding. I don't agree with it in particular because what he does is to take issue with the Federalist. Now, maybe he didn't understand the Federalist at this point. 
but certainly at the end he understands that what he's saying here is not true at all because the federalist is completely contrary to this in so many of the essays turning to our third think point we're going to compare the forensic and deliberative rhetoric and we're going to use webster again but in a trial closing argument in a criminal case. Now I gave you this article by Heinrichs entitled Why Harvard Killed Rhetoric. It actually appeared in the Harvard Alumni uh, Magazine and until relatively recently, it was available as such, but online, the only source I could find was this blog or website that is run by Heinrichs himself, but it's the same article and I've used it over the years. It's an, it's an amazing article and it's, and it's an important one to realize that the great tradition of rhetoric, which was prominent at the beginning and the founding and goes up through not only Webster, but we'll see it as I've said before in Frederick Douglass and Lincoln next in the next session we do. But finally it catches up and then the session after that, we're gonna go into a new era in which basically rhetoric is killed off. And that killing it off is described in this article as to how it happened. As to Webster himself, it's important to understand, as I mentioned before in an earlier session, that they're essentially trained in Ciceronian rhetoric. Now what's interesting from my point of view about what we're gonna hear in Webster's closing argument is that it doesn't have to be flowery and all of the kinds of add-ons that gave rhetoric a bad name. Webster's argument is a powerful argument and it is very pointed and would be in many ways applicable to a murder case today of a similar type. What I'd like you to do is something that I've done with students in the past, and that is to read to yourself one of the paragraphs from the closing argument before we actually go into the argument. So read it, and I'll allow a minute and a half to do so because it's 332 words. Average reading time is 250 words a minute. I asked you as I've had asked students in the past to read it because sometimes people have very different reactions. The first time I gave this to, to a class, the first student to respond said, the argument was unethical. And I said, why is it unethical? He said, because it makes you all emotional. Well, let's hear it and see what happens to your emotions. I am little accustomed, gentlemen, to the part which I am now attempting to perform. 
hardly more than once or twice has it happened to me to be concerned on the side of the government in any criminal prosecution whatever, and never until the present occasion in any case affecting life. But I very much regret that it should have been thought necessary to suggest to you that I am brought here to hurry you against the law and beyond the evidence. I hope I have too much regard for justice and too much respect for my own character to attempt either. And were I to make such attempt, I am sure that in this court nothing can be carried against the law, and that gentlemen, intelligent and just as you are, are not by any power to be hurried beyond the evidence. Though I could well have wished to shun this occasion, I have not felt at liberty to withhold my professional assistance when it is supposed that I may be in some degree useful in investigating and discovering the truth respecting this most extraordinary murder. It has seemed to be a duty incumbent on me, as on every other citizen, to do my best and my utmost to bring to light the perpetrators of this crime. Against the prisoner at the bar, as an individual, I cannot have the slightest prejudice. I would not do him the smallest injury or injustice. But I do not affect to be indifferent to the discovery and the punishment of this deep guilt. I cheerfully share in the opprobrium, how great soever it may be, which is cast on those who feel and manifest an anxious concern that all who had a part in planning or a hand in executing this deed of midnight assassination may be brought to answer for their enormous crime at the bar of public justice. In the opening part of his argument, he has to set the stage because this is a notorious killing. It's a killing for hire. And there's been nothing like this. It occurs in Salem, Massachusetts. And it not only upsets that whole area, but it is all over the place in terms of the publicity. And then Webster, who normally doesn't work for or argue for the government, usually against it, he's explaining why he's brought in and that this is all going to be not a matter of passion for which he is quite capable and he is known to be for that, but in fact, instead, this will be all orderly and according to the law, and that the jury will not allow him to do anything beyond that. So it's to settle things down. So let's continue. Gentlemen, it is a most extraordinary case. In some respects, it is hardly a precedent anywhere. Certainly none in our New England history. This bloody drama exhibited no suddenly excited, ungovernable rage. The actors in it were not surprised by any lion-like temptation springing upon their virtue and overcoming it before resistance could begin. Nor did they do the deed to glut savage vengeance or satiate long-settled and deadly hate. It was a cool, calculating, money-making murder. It was all hire and salary, not revenge. It was the weighing of money against life the counting out of so many pieces of silver against so many ounces of blood. An aged man, without any enemy in the world, in his own house and in his own bed, is made the victim of a butcherly murder for mere pay. Truly, here is a new lesson for painters and poets. Whoever shall hereafter draw the portrait of murder, if he will show it as it has been exhibited, where such example was last to have been looked for in the very bosom of our New England society, let him not give it the grim visage of Moloch, the brow knitted by revenge, the face black with settled hate, and the bloodshot eye emitting livid fires of malice. Let him draw, rather, a decorous, smooth-faced, bloodless demon, a picture in repose, rather than in action, not so much an example of human nature in its depravity and in its paroxysms of crime as an infernal being, a fiend, in the ordinary display and development of his character. The deed was executed with a degree of self-possession and steadiness equal to the wickedness with which it was planned. The circumstances now clearly in evidence spread out the whole scene before us. Deep sleep had fallen on the destined victim and on all beneath his roof. A healthful old man, to whom sleep was sweet, the first sound slumbers of the night held him in their soft but strong embrace. The assassin enters, through the window already prepared, into an unoccupied apartment. With noiseless foot he paces the lonely hall, half lighted by the moon. 
He winds up the ascent of stairs and reaches the door of the chamber. Of this he moves the lock by soft and continued pressure till it turns on its hinges without noise, and he enters and beholds his victim before him. The room is uncommonly open to the admission of light. The face of the innocent sleeper is turned from the murderer, and the beams of the moon resting on the gray locks of his aged temple show him where to strike. The fatal blow is given, and the victim passes without a struggle or emotion from the repose of sleep to the repose of death. It is the assassin's purpose to make sure work, and he plies the dagger, though it is obvious that life had been destroyed by the blow of the bludgeon. He even raises the aged arm, that he may not fall in his aim at the heart, and replaces it again over the wounds of the poniard. To finish the picture, he explores the wrist for the pulse. He feels for it, and ascertains that it beats no longer. It is accomplished. The deed is done. He retreats, retraces his steps to the window, passes out through it as he came in, and escapes. He has done the murder. No eye has seen him, no ear has heard him. The secret is his own, and it is safe. Ah, gentlemen, that was a dreadful mistake. Such a secret can be safe nowhere. The whole creation of God has neither nook nor corner where the guilty can bestow it, and say it is safe, not to speak of that eye which pierces all disguises and beholds everything as in the splendor of noon. Such secrets of guilt are never safe from detection, even by men. True it is, generally speaking, that murder will out. True it is that providence hath so ordained and doth so govern things that those who break the great law of heaven by shedding man's blood seldom succeed in avoiding discovery. Especially in a case exciting so much attention as this, discovery must come, and will come, sooner or later. A thousand eyes turn at once to explore every man, every thing, every circumstance connected with the time and place. A thousand ears can catch every whisper. A thousand excited minds intensely dwell on the scene, shedding all their light and ready to kindle the slightest circumstance into a blaze of discovery. Meanwhile, the guilty soul cannot keep its own secret. It is false to itself, or rather it feels an irresistible impulse to conscience to be true to itself. It labors under its guilty possession and knows not what to do with it. The human heart was not made for the residence of such an inhabitant. It finds itself preyed on by a torment which it dares not acknowledge to God or man. A vulture is devouring it, and it can ask no sympathy or assistance, either from heaven or earth. The secret which the murderer possesses soon comes to possess him, and like the evil spirits of which he read, it overcomes him and leads him whithersoever it will. He feels it beating at his heart, rising to his throat, and demanding disclosure. He thinks the whole world sees it in his face, reads it in his eyes, and almost hears its workings in the very silence of his thoughts. It has become his master. It betrays his decision. It breaks down his courage. It conquers his prudence. When suspicion from without begin to embarrass him, and the net of circumstances to entangle him, the fatal secret struggles with still greater violence to burst forth. It must be confessed. It will be confessed. There is no refuge from confession but suicide. And suicide is confession. There's so much packed into this. Having started out very coolly, he describes a situation based on the evidence, he says, in such a way that it is so easy to picture what's going on. And those picture words are extremely important and that's what builds the emotion to it. And then describing what happens to human nature, that those who did the killing could not live with themselves and at least one of them had to confess and that's how they really got the evidence here. Now, from a, Criticism point of view, the argument has been criticized and, and it has been praised as very Ciceroni. I leave it to you to decide what you think. 
you might wonder about some of the evidence, but there was evidence from an examination of the body. The examination indicated that the arm had to have been moved, but the pulse, no, he wouldn't have known, couldn't have known whether the pulse was checked. It would be a natural thing to do to make sure that the victim was dead, but that is part of an argument that he went too far and went beyond the evidence. So let's continue. Gentlemen, your whole concern should be to do your duty and leave consequences to take care of themselves. You will receive the law from the court. Your verdict, it is true, may endanger the prisoner's life, but then it is to save other lives. If the prisoner's guilt has been shown and proved beyond all reasonable doubt, you will convict him. If such reasonable doubts of guilt still remain, you will acquit him. You are the judges of the whole case. You owe a duty to the public as well to the prisoner at the bar. You cannot presume to be wiser than the law. Your duty is a plain, straightforward one. Doubtless, we would all judge him in mercy. Towards him as an individual, the law inculcates no hostility. But towards him, if proved to be a murderer, the law and the oaths you have taken and public justice demand that you do your duty. With consciences satisfied with the discharge of duty, no consequences can harm you. There is no evil that we cannot either face or fly from, but the consciousness of duty disregarded. A sense of duty pursues us ever. It is omnipresent, like the deity. If we take to ourselves the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, duty performed or duty violated, it is still with us, for our happiness or our misery. If we say the darkness shall cover us, in the darkness as in the light our obligations are yet with us. We cannot escape their power, nor fly from their presence. They are with us in this life, will be with us at its close. And in that scene of inconceivable solemnity, which lies yet further onward, we shall still find ourselves surrounded by the consciousness of duty to pain us wherever it has been violated and to console us so far as God may have given us grace to perform it. As he says in closing to the jury, your duty is plain. Now that's in those words or different words. It's a common thing for prosecutors to say. But he's much more detached and admirably so then often prosecutors are in such a bloody situation in which they are attempting to really bring down all the anger they possibly can on the jury. And yet, as terrible as this murder is, he wants to make sure that they are detached enough to apply the law and to do so without revenge. A few more words about the decline of rhetoric. I gave you the article by Heinrich on why Harvard did, uh, killed rhetoric. Uh, first of all, it's the educational component. And there were people who were educated in rhetoric who continue to live for a while. And that's why we have Webster and we'll come back next time to Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. But beyond that, it is going to be a change. First of all, we'll see in session well, another change at Harvard, where the shift is to science. And that has a huge impact, not only on the way people think, but on the way people talk and on the way people write. Fast forward to today, what do we find in terms of opportunity? Young lawyers find there are very few opportunities to actually get trial experience. The traditional path is to go into a public defender's office or a prosecutor's office. But in many places around the country, the plea bargaining is so overwhelming that very few cases actually go to trial for a number of reasons. That's in state court. Federal court, it's somewhat different. That is, there are not as many cases, but the cases that do come along, most of them, or the big ones, are extremely complex. And so it's not the place that you cut your teeth on trying cases. And the overwhelming result in both federal court and state court is plea bargaining. What about civil litigation? Well, unless you're doing fender benders, most of it pleads out, and even the fender benders plead out. 
So again, there's not much opportunity. Well, when there's not opportunity, people aren't going to work that much at it. Yes, I know we've had a great increase in trial advocacy courses in law school, but where are the opportunities for young lawyers to get to practice? And it does take practice, okay? So beyond that, there, there are still other things. That is to say, we've had a shift in the rhetoric. What do I mean? It, whereas a Webster or a Lincoln would argue both at trial and appellate levels, and Webster at Supreme Court level, the highest level, an outstanding advocate at the Supreme Court and we saw in a murder case. So very different. But today, generally you have people who specialize in appellate argument. Appellate argument, especially in federal court, is a different animal altogether than trial argument. And uh, appellate argument is brief writing. And even in the Supreme Court, you get a compressed oral argument. I mean, from nine days back to the time of, of uh, McCullough, some decades ago in the Supreme Court, it was an hour, but now it's down to a half hour generally. And some of the justices, I would say a number of them, basically don't learn a great deal from oral argument, at least in constitutional cases, maybe in tax cases. But Justice Thomas, at least before COVID, during which period he has asked some questions, used to say that he didn't think that there was much to be learned in oral argument. So in many ways, you can say something that was said by a great rhetorician, and that was uh, McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan. He coined the phrase in the 60s, the medium is the message. That is the filter through which things come control things. And from the shift, to writing from oral. Remember the Supreme Court didn't initially even have any briefs and then they were brief briefs. And now they're long briefs. When your focus is writing as opposed to oral, the argument will be different. It is a case of the medium controlling the message in large part. Also, what has happened to the function that jury trials used to serve, at least in the 19th century is not only entertainment, it was, but it was a source of education. Remember, John Adams educating the jury in the trial where he represented the British soldiers. soldiers. And Webster was educating on the rule of law in the trial that you heard him in terms of his close to the argument, uh, to the jury, both at the beginning and at the end. Where do people learn about trials today? Well, television, of course. Ah, very few television dramas reflect what actually happens in the courtroom. Yes, in, in recent years, they're much more reliable and accurate than they were when Perry Mason was the norm. But generally, these trial dramas are written by left-wingers and they're full of messaging and propaganda. So we've gone from a notion of the rule of law in the old kinds of arguments to a different understanding maybe of what the rule of law and what is expected in the courtroom. Remember, we began with the trial of the Chicago Seven and their understanding of how a courtroom should look and how they should behave. In any event, let's look forward to next session. And here's what I'm gonna cover next week. So for next week, we're going to have Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Regarding Douglass, I'm going to have available on the event page a summary uh, of his movement and change on his attitude towards the Constitution. Regarding Lincoln, I'm going to ask you to read chapter four in the ethics of rhetoric. And I wanna pay more attention to this chapter than I paid to any of the other chapters in this book. The one chapter that I paid a lot of attention to, we just finished regarding uh, that touched on the great three orators. And the book will contra contrast what Lincoln does as opposed to what they do. 
Looking ahead, I would suggest that for 12 and 13, you might want to, sessions 12 and 13, you might want to read ahead in Professor Barnett's book and read chapters five and eight from which I will take some parts of that or focus on some parts of it. As to the other chapters, we're just not going to have time and they don't fit quite as neatly into what we're doing. So I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you for joining us this week. Thank you.